Hello everyone, my name is Nick with Helio. Today's video is going to be the first in a series of videos uh, going over the operations manual. So I think this series will probably be pretty long, so we're going to break it up into, I don't know, maybe eight or ten uh, little sections. Um, we're going to be going over version 4.1 of the manual. Now we try to update these once a quarter or every six months maybe uh, to keep everything latest with all of our software and hardware updates. Um, but even if you're watching this later and we have maybe a 4.2 or 4.3 operations manual out, most of this should still apply as far as you know learning the basics of how to use these drones. I mean stuff like chargers and batteries don't really change that much. So this should be good to go for quite a little while. Um, this first video today is going to just be a quick introduction and going through some of the hardware. Um, and yeah, without further ado, we will get started. So um, just to introduce these drones and Helio, uh, Helio makes large agricultural sprayer drones. Um, these drones are not toys. So if you bought one of these drones, you most likely bought it for a very good reason. Um, spraying some crops, most likely. Um, you should know if you spent this much on a drone that it is not, it's not built to be used for fun, flying around for fun. Um, these drones do not fly the same as a little toy camera drone that you know buzzes around like a little speedboat. Um, these drones fly more like yachts. You know, if you've got a 300 pound aircraft in the air, you gotta understand that this thing will take some time to speed up, it will take some time to slow down, and if you do have an incident, they can be extremely dangerous, um, just due to the sheer size of these things. So, um, you're gonna want to take your safety very seriously, take your education with how to use these drones very seriously, uh, from a fundamental level, these drones are generally used autonomously. The drones are autonomous, not intelligent. They will do what you tell them to do. So as much time as you spend during the planning phase, as far as learning, giving your drone the best chance of success, then you will have the, the highest chance of success in using it. Uh, if you want to get a drone to fly around for fun, I would recommend go on Amazon and get one for 50 bucks and go use that one to go and fly around. Um, all right, so um, kind of moving on here. We have some definitions. We are not going to go through these um, super closely just because this is more for reference as you're going through the manual. So I would recommend just refer back to this definitions page as you're reading through the manual to help understand, you know, what some of these words are and, you know, what they're being used for, what they mean. All right, so first section, hardware. Um, if you receive a drone from Helio, they will, you know, show up via LTL. So we ship our drones out in freight in these big wooden crates. So um, the wooden crates are you know, for the 10 and 16, they're four feet by four feet by 33 inches tall. Uh, the drone will come fully assembled. Um, it's kind of screwed down in there, so you can't really see it in the picture here, but the feet to the drone have C-clamps just holding it down into the floor. Uh, batteries and chargers, and if you got a spare parts kit, will be kind of fastened in there with these little rubber straps. Um, you will have a little blue tool bag which should have all of the stuff that you need like radios, tools, stuff like that and you should have a stack of paperwork. Uh, this stack of paperwork should have a little flash drive with another copy of all the manuals, um, software installers, stuff like that. When you would have given us a deposit for the drone you should have received all that stuff anyway so this is just another copy you were already emailed all of this. This is just extra. Um, so getting this crate open, um, there's just little Phillips screws all the way around the edge. You'll want to use 
two people to get this lid off and probably going to want to use some gloves so you don't get some splinters on your fingers. And just be careful to not drop the lid into the crate onto the drone. We haven't had anyone do it before, but just be careful. So that's Ag-10 and Ag-16. The Ag-30, um, it's got two levels to it. So the bottom level is the same as the Ag-10 and Ag-16, just the same base crate, 48 by 48 by 33. It has that that the drone is in. On top of that, there's gonna be another crate that's 48 by 48 by uh, whatever the difference is between 52 and 33, like another 20 inches, where we put all the batteries and chargers because they don't fit in the lower crate. So uh, with this one, you wanna take that top part off, take out all your batteries and chargers, kind of take a, apart this part of the crate, and then same deal, get down to the bottom and get that drone out. Now, some people use these drones for or sorry, these crates for transport. So they'll put the drones back in there and use it to move them around. Can if you want, um, you may need to make some modifications if you want to do that. Generally, I would say maybe is best used for long-term storage, you know, during the off season to keep everything safe and in one place. Um, it's really not the most convenient for just moving stuff around because the, you know, the crate itself weighs a couple hundred pounds, a few hundred pounds. So you basically need a pallet jack to move it around. Um, so yeah, not really intended for daily use, but again, it's up to you. I uh, don't have a picture of the Ag-72. Uh, basically the same thing though, except the crate, instead of uh, four feet by four feet, it's roughly eight feet by four feet. Um, the drone ships land out. So um, drones and shelves, they're shipped in that folded position. Um, once you, you know, go to use them, you unfold them, lock out the elbows, they all look as such. Uh, there is more information in the maintenance manual about specific hardware for each drone. So if you, you know, need more info about that, just jump over there. All right, so now batteries and chargers. Um, first thing, batteries. So uh, as of right now, Helio is primarily uh, providing customers with the tattoo batteries for um, the 10, 16, and 30. So the 10 uses a single uh, 16,000 milliamp hour battery. The 16 uses a single 22,000, and the 30 uses two 16,000s. So these batteries come with a battery bag which we recommend to keep the batteries inside those bags to just keep them from getting damaged. Um, the bags are fire resistant, so you know, in case you have an accident, um, should keep things a little more protected. Um, Helio does not make these batteries. Um, there is a warranty on the battery that Helio passes through. So if there ever needs to be a warranty claim on a battery, Helio will communicate with Tattoo on your behalf just to make things a little easier. And you know, we know what they're looking for, so kind of pass things over. Um, they will only hold their warranty if the batteries are charged according to their specifications. Um, one other thing about these Tattoo batteries, there is a some LEDs on the top. Um, there's a couple of different LEDs. There's LEDs with like a button next to it here. If you press that button, it's supposed to indicate the relative charge level. Um, generally, it does a pretty good job. I wouldn't put too much faith in it. You know, if it shows four bars, it still could be, you know, like 85% charged, which depending on what you're doing, maybe isn't really enough. So they're a good rough indication, but I wouldn't put too much stock in them. On the other side, there is uh, three little triangles. Now, those little triangles are meant to indicate the relative health of the battery. They don't always work super great, and if you call Tattoo and say the lights are showing this or that, they won't warranty anything based off of what those lights say. So, uh, you know, put as much stock in those as you want. They tell us for the most part to ignore them. Um, lastly, try to keep these batteries dry, of course. You know, they're batteries, so generally don't want to be getting them super wet. And you'll want to keep them in a climate-controlled environment. So, you know, 
you're talking over the winter or as much as you can over the summer, um, there's in, in the appendix, there's a full uh, manual from Tattoo for these batteries that kind of lists the temperature ranges that they're looking for. But in general, you just want to keep these uh, fairly climate controlled. So the batteries for these drones here, 10, 16, and 30, run on a 12S system. So basically what that means is it's just a 50 volt for a full battery. So, you know, there's four important values for this battery of just charge level. Full battery, 50.4 volts. Uh, low battery to return home. So when the drone sees this battery level for seven seconds, it's gonna come home, that's 42.8 volts. Important to know here that the drone does not do an intelligent RTL based off its relative weight or distance from home. It's just going to flat RTL at this distance, which will matter a lot if you are trying to do a mission that's a mile and a half away and you know, you're trying to rely on this to RTL you home. It's really not meant for that. This cutoff here is meant for standard ag operations. Maybe you're going half a mile away, doing some spraying, coming back. If you are kind of going out of that normal operation, you need to be watching this voltage yourself. Now, this comes into play for particular if people are using something like a, a really low rate stuff or just something kind of strange where you're filling up the tank all the way full and for whatever reason you only spray a quarter of the tank, well, this low battery RTL is in particular not going to do that great if your tank is full. Again, it's meant for a normal spray operation where a drone starts with a full tank, sprays it down, and it's returning home with an empty tank. Drone uses a lot more battery when the tank is full than when the tank is empty. So again, if you are not doing standard operations, you need to pay attention to this battery level and pull it home early yourself if you're extra far away or extra heavy. Um, so third cutoff is the low battery land. So this is 41.5 volts, sustained for seven seconds. Um, this one, instead of triggering the drone to come home, if it comes, if it breaches this level, the drone is going to land in place. It's generally doing this because it thinks it does not have enough battery to make it all the way home. Now, this this low battery land, I tell you right now, it means it. If you get put into a low battery land, the drone probably has less than a minute, maybe 40 seconds of flight time left. You can, as the operator, at any point during RTL or even land, tell the drone to stop what it's doing and go back to the mission where you can take over manually. You always have the ability to take over the drone, but it's only gonna do this once. So we recommend that if the drone is in low battery land, unless that drone is over the top of a pond or some people, that you let it land. Even if it's 20 yards away and it's gonna land in some corn, I can tell you from experience, having seen it before, there's been a number of times where people think, oh, well, it's almost home. You know, I know it says it needs to land. I'm just gonna bring it a little bit farther. They press RTL and the drone pulls out of land, starts coming back and it gets almost to the ground. Maybe it's like five, 10 yards off the ground from that RTL and it just falls out of the sky because it ran out of battery. I would just, as much as you can, if it, if it's going to low battery land, just know that it means it. it. It needs to land right now. And if you override it, there's a decent chance that the thing is just gonna fall out of the sky. Now again, if you're over a pond, you're over some people or something like that, where yeah, maybe it's better to fall out of the sky 20 yards to the right versus landing into a pond, well, that's up to you. Um, now, last level to be aware of, uh, 40 volts, that is the thrust loss limit. So once you get under 40 volts, um, the drone is, can't really keep itself in the air anymore. That's barely enough to keep the motors running. You are pretty much about to fall out of the sky. Anything under 40, the drone can't control itself too much anymore. What it will do is it will just start rapidly descending because it doesn't have enough juice to keep it in the air. And with all the juice that it has left, it's gonna try to keep itself relatively flat. So it lands flat instead of sideways. All right, so that is the 12S battery. So again, the 10, 16, and 30. 
Now, uh, the 14S battery. So this is for the 72. Um, 14S, again, just means it's a, a different voltage. So these batteries are not compatible with each other. 72 runs on a different voltage than the rest of the other drones. So, um, similar situation across the board. Um, Helio does not hold a warranty on the battery separately. All warranties pass straight through to OK Cell. So OK Cell is the brand for this battery. Uh, not the same as Tattoo for the other one. OK Cell. Similar thing where it has the charge lights and I believe it has the triangles as well on the top. You can trust them about as much. I mean, they work OK. Um, don't always work super great. They will not honor any warranty just because the lights aren't working. If the, ba if the battery's working, it's working. OK Cell does not have a balance cable. So one thing I probably forgot to mention, the 12S batteries, they have a balance cable, which is a second plug on the side here. You have the main plug, and then there's a second little plug on the side that you plug into a charger um, that you should plug in. But we'll get to that in the chargers here in a moment. Um, but anyway, OK cells do not have balance cables. Um, again, climate controlled environment. The 72 uses two of these 42,000 milliamp hour batteries at 14S. So a lot of battery for that 72. Each of these batteries weighs about 30 pounds. So you got 60 pounds of batteries on the 72. Very uh, serious stuff there. Um, uses a lot of juice to keep these charged. So similar deal, I'm not gonna get into the details as much of the four voltage cutoffs, um, cause you already know what they do. So full battery on this one, 60.4. Uh, low battery RTL 49.5 for 7 seconds, low battery land 47.5, and low battery thrust loss 45 volts. So how those work, all the same as on the 12S, but these are the cutoffs for 14S. Alright, so um, battery maintenance. So you should charge the batteries at 1C, which is just a standard charge rate. Now, um, there's going to be some safety warnings, stuff like that, written on the battery. Um, follow those. There's little manuals um, in the appendix for the batteries. Follow those. Um, you should not discharge a battery below, if it's 12S, 40 volts, 45 volts, if it's 14S. Um, if you you know, it's not really good for these batteries to be sitting super full or super empty. Uh, generally for storage, at least a battery is ideal to be kind of sitting in the middle somewhere. You know, it's not great for a battery to be sitting full for a long time, but it's not the end of the world. Now, if you let a battery sit discharged too much, um, you can actually have that battery completely die on you. So again, if it's too full, for too long, yeah, you'll just wear down the battery a bit. But if it's too low, like if we if we fly a battery down to 40 volts, so that thing probably fell out of the sky, now you leave it on the ground for, you know, two months after that, you go and put it away after you ran this battery way low. The next time you go to grab that thing, it very well likely will just be totally dead. Um, another thing to look out for is if you just for whatever reason you leave a battery plugged into a drone for like four or five hours at a time, it will eventually drain down the batteries. And again, if you get too low, that battery may never come back. Um, important thing to, to talk about, we talk about 1C, I understand most people don't really know what that means. Um, basically, it's just the charge speed. So the faster you charge it would be considered 2C or 3C is, is a charging speed. Half a C would be like a slow charge. So just so you kind of know what that means. Uh, next section here, battery sparking. So the plugs, these connectors on the batteries may spark sometimes when you plug them in. Now, if that happens, what can happen is the plug will just wear out, it'll get dirty, but it's not gonna harm the drone. Uh, I mean, those connectors, they may get worn out pretty quick and you know, may need to be replaced, but the drone itself, power system and all that, it will be fine. Now, if this starts happening, um, there is a little anti-spark pin in those connectors that can just wear out. I mean, we test them, you know, hundreds of times before the drones go out. 
some of those anti-spark pins will last for years and unfortunately others will just last for a couple of months. Now, if you can keep those uh, connectors greased so they kind of plug in and out a little easier, that will help, that will help them last a little bit longer. You can replace the drone side plug, which has that anti-spark pin um, down the line if it's sparking, but um, this can be difficult. So you don't always want to do it, um, but if there is sparking, just don't worry about it too much. If you do want to fix it, uh, just talk to your Helio representative and they can help you out, get it fixed. All right, so um, storage and cycling, this kind of touches back to what we were talking about earlier with the maintenance. So these batteries need to be cycled every three months. If you do not do this, they very well may get too low and die. Um, now, tattoo as a requirement to keep your warranty from going void requires a cycle every three months. Now, cycling, what that means is discharging the battery down just to like a lower level and then charging it back up again to a kind of 50%-ish range. Now, this is of course easier to do if you can just fly the drone. Not always possible in the winter time. Um, so, you know, you can just leave it plugged into the drone. Some of the chargers, there is a storage mode to where that will discharge the battery. If you do that, that can work too. So, um, cycling the battery. So first you wanna charge the battery all the way up. Then you wanna bring the battery down, whether using the storage capability on the charger to kind of bring it down to like 30% or flying the drone down to like 30% then um, you want to plug it back in and charge it back up again to 50 or 60 percent. Once you have plugged it back in and like charge it back up, whenever it's done, you need to unplug the battery. If you just unplug the charger, it doesn't work like a trickle charge, like for a car battery where you can just leave it plugged in and it's going to keep, keep it at that level. If you plug it in, you charge it up and then you yank the battery charger cord that charger will draw a little bit of power from that battery and will kill it in a matter of weeks. So you cannot do that. You, you know, to cycle the batteries, you burn it down a bit, charge it up, and then unplug it and let it sit there. And it should be good for at least a few months. Now, um, if you don't have time to do this, for whatever reason, um, you know, maybe your batteries are out of warranty anyway, you don't really care about that, but just in all being realistic, you just don't want your batteries to die. You don't have time to go and it's winter, you can't fly the drone down and you don't feel like waiting for it to, to store a charge down. Um, at the very least, just charge it back up to 50 to 60% every few months. Now, like I was saying before, that's the thing that you really need to worry about is the battery getting down too low and then it just, it just totally dies and you can't recover it. So that's what you really need to pay attention to. If you don't have time to fully cycle it, just charge it back up a little bit. Keep it at 50, 60% every few months to just keep those batteries alive. All right, and lastly, just some best practices um, for these batteries. Batteries are the fuel cost of the drone. So, you know, there's a number of things you can do to be more fuel efficient, let's say. Um, you know, these batteries only get so many cycles, just like any battery, charge and discharge. You can only do so many times before the battery's just not good for much anymore. Now, what you can do to maximize those numbers of cycles is a few different things. So number one, try not to charge the batteries when they're super hot. Now, not always possible, um, but if you can, try to let them cool down a bit. Same thing with your chargers. Not only will they last longer but they will charge a little quicker too so this gets into your trailer and kind of how you're setting that up and making sure that you have some cooling in your trailer to keep at least not 100 degrees you know and try to bring it down a little bit before you charge it up again so that's number one um, number two if you're not going to use your batteries for more than like four or five days put them back down to that like 50 60 percent again if you leave it at 100 percent for a whole week Again, it's not the end of the world, but it will take a little bit of life off. Um, last one is slow charging versus fast charging. So 
you want to just whenever you can, maybe in the evening or something when you're done spraying or if you're ahead of your batteries a little bit, slow charge your batteries. They will last longer. The more often, more frequently you fast charge the batteries, it will just cause more batteries to the damage to, to the battery cells over time. All three of these, none of these you do, you know, oh, I'm charging my batteries hot or I'm leaving them full for a while. It's not like you do one of these things and the battery is just going to die. It's, it just wears on them over time. You're just going to get less total cycles if you do these things. Now, maybe that doesn't matter too much because you don't care. You're in a hurry. You're going to charge your batteries hot. You're not going to worry about trickle charging and stuff like that. That's fine. Just it can't expect them to get as many total cycles as you otherwise would. Um, next one. So cold weather um, doesn't apply to most of our customers, but something to be aware of. If you're flying and it is really cold temperatures, be aware that this can cause a voltage drop in batteries. So batteries just don't work very well when you're, you know, 30 degrees outside. Um, they may just only fly for like two minutes instead of 20. So just something to be aware of if you're flying in cold temperatures, freezing temperatures, you need to warm up the batteries a bit in order for them to work normally. Um, and lastly, the batteries can be very dangerous if they are punctured or shorted or just treated badly. You know, if you're getting them wet, if you're damaging them, um, in particular, if you poke a hole through it from the side, you know, we talked about 12S versus 14S, stuff like that. The battery is basically 12 or 14 little batteries inside of a box. And if you poke a hole through it and you short across it, that battery will catch fire and you will not be able to put it out. Um, if you want to get a little bit scared of this stuff, then go on YouTube and look up LiPo battery fire. Um, you want to be careful with these batteries, put them in the battery bags, treat them with some respect, and you know maybe keep them in the garage um, just in case. It's not really something that ever happens, it's just something you want to be careful about. All right, so next section is the chargers. So we have two chargers to go through here. We've got the Sky RC charger, which is for the 12S batteries, again for the 10, 16, and 30. And then we have the OK cell charger, which is for the AG72 batteries. Um, all right, so Sky RC charger, uh, it's a 3000 watt charger. Uh, if it's the green one, the black one is 2500 watt. I think we just ship out the green ones. We have some other chargers that we've used in the past. Um, if you go to the appendix of this manual, you will find the sections for those chargers. Uh, a couple important things to know, if you want to use all 3000 watts, the charger needs to be plugged into 220 volts. Uh, if you plug into 110, you're only gonna get 1200 watts. It will not fast charge. Uh, so if you want to fast charge, you gotta be on 220. Um, if you are in, do okay yeah so um, you have some dimensions here for you know strategizing planning purposes it weighs 13 pounds um, all right so charging steps so you basically have you know the little charger here there's no on off switch it's just a plug so you plug it in it turns on there are three little buttons on the front just like the batteries helio does not make the chargers they do have some chinese on them kind of no hiding that um, we would like to make chargers one day, but not yet. Um, so to charge this thing, um, plug it in, ideally to 220. To plug it into 220, you're probably going to need some adapters, um, which Helio sells on our website. Um, there, there's a later section in this manual about uh, trailers and stuff like that in the appendix, which I think has pictures of the adapters that you'll need. Um, so first thing you want to do is plug in that main cable and the balance cable that we were talking about before. So on this charger, you've got this main plug and then you've got a little balance plug that takes this little uh, 12 pin cable here. So you wanna plug in both of these. Uh, if you don't plug in both of them, sometimes they'll charge, most of the time they won't. Um, but it is not as good on the battery to not use this. So um, if that little cable is tearing your fingers up, we sell a different version that's a little nicer on the hand. Um, if you click this channel button, that'll let you pick. The, the thing has four plugs. 
only plugs one and two have balance ports, so really you're just going to use plugs one and two. Um, you can pick the channel, then if you hit mode, you can change between charge, fast charge, and storage charge. So charge does just a standard charge, so it works 110 or 220, but it's only going to charge at the, you know, 12, 1200 watts. Uh, fast charge will go up to 60 amps, it has to be in 220. Even if you pick fast charge and you're plugged in 110, it's just going to standard charge. And then storage charge. So storage charge um, will bring those batteries down. A lot of time it'll bring it farther down than you want. Sometimes it'll bring it down into the 30s. So you generally don't really want to do this unless you're going to charge it back up a little bit to say 50-60%. Um, so the balance or the Sky RC will charge two batteries at a time, but it won't fast charge two batteries at a time. If you plug in two batteries and you hit standard charge, it will, if the batteries are around the same voltage, it will charge them both at the same time. If they are not at the same voltage, it will just pick one and it'll charge that one first. So if you're trying to charge two at a time, you got to make sure they're at pretty close to the same voltage. And again, doing a fast charge, it will just do one at a time. Um, all right, so just some tips. Um, see, we already talked about the 220 adapter. Um, do do uh, the batteries will? It's important to know the batteries will very often charge from. Say you take it off the drone, it's like 40 percent. It will charge up to about 95 percent really fast, especially when you're doing the fast charge. Now, that last five percent where it kind of balances the cells out can take a long time. So if you're in a big hurry, you can take it off at 95%. This is one of those things, not really ideal for the battery. You know, the more you do this, it's going to get you less cycles over time. Um, another very important thing to know that if you're fast charging, Tattoo considers that immediately avoiding your warranty on the batteries. Um, not that we ever really see batteries just dying in the first year anyway the warranty is only one year so I wouldn't worry about it too much but if you want to keep that warranty on the battery then you can't fast charge and they have tracking on them they can see if you've been fast charging because uh, in their eyes it's just charging it too fast and if the battery dies then I guess that's you deserve it I guess in tattoo size um, last thing you want to give it a lot of ventilation if you give these chargers just full of hot air a lot of the time, well, they for sure won't charge as fast and they can just shut down if they get too hot. So they do pump out a lot of hot air. So you're gonna want to keep them ventilated if you can. All right, so uh, 14S charger. This is the OK cell charger. So everything really pretty similar. Uh, you got 1500 watts if you're plugging into 110, uh, 3000 watts if you're going 220. Um, one battery in general will, if you're on the slow charge mode, so you're into 110, it'll take you about an hour to charge a battery. Uh, if you're going in fast charge mode, it'll take you about half an hour. Um, yeah, that's one thing we didn't talk about up here. Slow versus fast. You'll have to try it yourself on the Sky RC, but it can be anywhere, you know, if you're doing fast charging Sky RC, just to bring it back a bit, uh, fast charge you might be... I don't know, 15, 20 minutes if you're doing pretty good on the 16 amp battery. Uh, slow charge, you know, more like 40, 45, um, kind of somewhere in that range. Anyway, back to the OK cell. So yeah, like I said, 30 minutes or an hour. Charging this thing, um, there's buttons on here, but you don't need to press anything. Basically, there's a switch on the back with this one. So you want to turn on the switch, turns on the charger, um, then you plug in your battery. Now this thing has two battery cables on here. You only need to plug in one of them. So the OK cell battery, the big one, even though it has two plugs, you just plug in one to this charger and then it just starts charging. Um, it will only charge one battery at a time. If you want to charge two batteries at a time, you just can't. So you plug in two batteries into the charger, it's just going to pick one, charge that one, and then move on to the next. Again, you do not need to plug in both of these, and if you do, I mean, it's okay, it's just it's not gonna do anything. Um, again, it just automatically starts charging. There's no option for fast, slow. Like if you're, if you're plugged into 220, it's just gonna charge faster. If you're plugged into 110, it's just gonna charge slower. 
there is no storage charge options it's just plug it in and it goes now um, there are some settings on this if you click around I think it's all in Chinese probably um, I would not recommend clicking around in that settings uh, it can be confusing and we set all those settings as they need to be before the before the charger goes out so I really would not click around on this charger too much you just plug it in let her go and that's it all right so that's it for batteries and chargers uh, next here we've got our um, handheld remote controller and our RFD telemetry modem. So um, just kind of going back up here into this uh, box picture here, we have this blue tool bag. So this is where you're going to find the rest of the stuff we're going to talk about. We're talking about the batteries and chargers, which you find in these boxes, and the battery fireproof bags right there. Um, now we're talking about the contents of this blue toolkit here. So right off the bat, first one, we have um, your two primary methods of communication with this drone. So we're gonna talk a little bit more later about the RC and how exactly to use it. We'll have a whole section about that. Um, for now, just kind of introducing it. Um, so you got the controller. This controller um, can fly the drone around manually and it can kind of toggle the pump on and off and this is what's used to show the video feed. Now, this, this controller here is not connected to the software. It has no Helio software on it. There is a software on it. We've unplugged all of the communication with the drones, so you can't like plan missions and stuff like that on there. Now, you can, like I said, you watch the video and you know fly it around. You can still command those flight modes. You can put it into RTL, land, brake, but again, there's no autopilot stuff going on here. Now, the battery on this thing is supposed to last eight to 12 hours. If it's turned on and shown video the whole time, a lot of the time it won't. Um, if you wanna have this thing turned on all the time, I would recommend having some way to charge it kind of in the middle of the day. Uh, it's big screen, not a huge battery in there. Um, most of our customers aren't really using it all the time, but if you do plan on it, just plan on charging it. Next thing here, so again, that controller flying manually. This uh, radio modem here is for communicating your missions uh, to the drone. So this is a this radio plugs into the USB port on your laptop. Um, basically, a little radio modem with two antennas that just screw onto it, connect it to the USB port, and then that's how the software on your computer sends commands to the drone and sends missions to the drone. You can use this to you know, click to fly, you can kind of manually fly the drone around using the computer. It is encrypted and it can be a little delicate. So there's these two long antennas on there. You generally want to take those off for transport because uh, if you don't, then you can snap off those antennas pretty easy uh, just because they're kind of long and it just happens. So transport, recommend taking those off. Um, but these are your two, the, both of these are going to be found in that blue bag, um, your two methods of communication with the drone. All right, so what else is in that bag? We've got a GPS tracker, uh, just a handheld GPS device for walking around and marking fields. You've got pre-flight and maintenance checklists, some screws, USB cable, USB-C cable, um, some various tools for maintenance, so motor level, screws, torque wrench. There's gonna be a little flash drive. Um, and like I said a second ago, you've got that handheld RC and then the radio for the computer. So all that should be inside your little blue tool bag. And lastly, the requirements for the software. Hopefully you will have already had this software on your computer by the time you get the drone and been flying around, but maybe, maybe not. Um, computer requirements, you need to be Windows 10 or 11, uh, i3 processor, AMD or Intel only, and that Microsoft ARM SQ1 does not work. Uh, there is no Apple or Android apps. It is only a Windows app for now. You're going to want 8 gigabytes of RAM. And um, just as a recommendation, we use a Surface Pro 9 um, generally for our testing. Um, it's pretty lightweight, not super durable though. If you're picking something to buy, I would recommend looking at the screen brightness. Um, that's going to matter to you quite a bit. 
you know, battery life, maybe not always a huge deal because you're probably sat down in one place, plugged in anyway, but for sure that screen brightness is going to mean a lot. And you, a lot of the time, you know, depends on what you're doing, but you may want a pretty big screen, just especially if you have multiple drones, it can help a lot for your mission planning. Um, this computer is not included in general with the, with the purchase, unless it was an add-on. All right, so um, last couple of things here uh, before we wrap up this video, just a few tips for this ground station. And by ground station, I just mean your place where you're sitting down controlling this drone. Um, I would recommend put some time into this as far as setting up your trailer, where you're gonna be controlling these drones from. It makes a very big difference to your success. Um, if you are five, six minutes on the ground doing your batteries and you know filling your tank and stuff versus 45 seconds on the ground, when these flights are only you know eight, nine minutes long, that makes a huge difference if you are really quick on the ground. Uh, same thing for setting up and tearing down. A lot of the time, maybe you're only doing 50 acre fields, you know, 30 acre fields even. If it takes you half an hour, 45 minutes to set up versus 10 minutes, that's a huge efficiency boost throughout the day. So you're gonna wanna spend some time just thinking about this, how you want everything set up, really, you know, put in some effort on that. Um, some creature comforts will go a long way. So having some shade, table, chair, you know, I mentioned this kind of at the top of the video, you, the drone is autonomous, not intelligent. It's gonna do what you tell it to do. So the more that you are able to focus on the task of you know, giving it a safe mission and the better you're able to think about what's going on, the better that you're gonna do. And it seems silly, but having a table, having a chair, having some shade goes a long way to allow you to focus on what you're doing as opposed to really just trying to get through it, you know, just crank it out, get the thing in the air. Um, so having a mouse helps, similar sort of vein there. Having a house, mouse, having a bigger screen helps a lot. Uh, lastly, for this ground control station, that RFD and here link have a lot better reception with a line of sight to the drone. So if you go, you know, drone takes off, it's 15 feet in the air over the tops of corn. If that thing goes behind a little bit of a hill, all of a sudden that signal is trying to fight through, you know, a quarter mile of straight corn or dirt you're probably gonna lose connection. So we really recommend you take that radio, put a little USB extension cable or something like that on it, put it up into the air. So that thing can have a line of sight to the drone as much as possible. That's gonna help ensure that you have communication with the drone at all times. Um, that'll go a long way. Uh, next one here, GPS tracker. So that's what that thing looks like. It's a little handheld device you basically plug into your laptop or tablet with a USB-C cable. Um, we're working on an app to put on your phone, so you just plug it into your phone, uh, coming soon. Um, but it's basically two parts. You've got this little grain bin on the top and this little kind of puck on the bottom. You want to screw the grain bin in and make sure it's, you know, don't tear the thing off, but make sure it's pretty snug on there. If it gets loose, then you're going to start to get pretty bad reception. Um, it's going to take at least a couple of minutes to boot up and get signal. Um, should be pretty accurate. It's going to be one of your most accurate ways to be marking obstacles and field boundaries. So I would use it if you can. Not everyone does. Some people it fits in with their operation. Other people it doesn't. Um, as far as some tips for using this, doesn't have a battery, has to be plugged into the computer. It's not required by any means for making missions or marking obstacles. You can always just draw them on the screen. Um, you want to keep this thing faced up to the sky. That's the antenna. You turn it down on the ground, you're not going to get very good accuracy. Um, if you're inside of a vehicle, that will also very much reduce your accuracy. Clear line of sight to the sky will help quite a bit. Um, similar thing for marking underneath overhanging branches from trees and stuff like that. You don't want to do that anyway. You don't want to be flying underneath that, but just something to look out for. Also not as accurate if you are moving while you mark. It's generally best to stop, mark an obstacle, then keep going. And yeah, whenever you mark that stuff, it will save into the software. We'll get into more details about that later um, when we get to that software video. Um, but yeah, so this has been the first of, like I said, 10 or 12 videos about the operations manual. Uh, we went through the introduction and hardware 
and I will see you in the next one. Thank you for watching.